Hey everyone, Pastor George here with today's Theologue. I hope all of you are having a wonderful kind of post-Christmas break for some of you or that you're kind of being able to get into the swing of things again. And so I thought I would do something more fun today. I, I know that a lot of people like when I react to other preachers and stuff like that, so I thought I would do that. Um, I, this popped up on my Twitter and I, I will say, granted, this is like a one minute and something clip, so maybe the whole sermon kind of recovers here. But this is a sermon from a televangelist called uh, Jesse Duplantis, who I had never heard before. So I had to do a little research on him. And we'll talk a little bit about his theology uh, if you happen to not know him. And we'll see actually how it impacts his understanding. But this was from their Christmas broadcast. And I want you guys to listen to this beginning of the clip. It's not the whole thing, but the beginning of what it's what it's going to say. And I want you to think, what what is he going to talk about? That's what I want you to think about. So uh, I'm going to play it for you now. The book of Isaiah, chapter 9, I want to read verse 6. For unto us, Isaiah 9, verse 6, for unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. All right, so you heard it there, right? He uses a classic Bible passage for Christmas, Isaiah 9, 6, this messianic prophecy from the prophet Isaiah, where it talks about the titles that the Messiah will have, right? Prince of Peace, Mighty God, Counselor, all that type of stuff right? So the natural thing to think is, is, oh, okay, well, this is going to be talking about Jesus. And so this is where he goes with it. And you'll, I, hopefully you'll be as kind of shocked as I was when I heard this. Yet the book of Ephesians chapter 5 verse 1 says, be you therefore imitators of God as dear children. So when I look at Isaiah 9, 6, where is the government now? It's on us. The government of the world is on mankind. And because we're made in God's image and in God's likeness, you can call us wonderful. Yes. Counselor. Yes. Mighty God, Christ in us. The everlasting Father. Woo! The Prince of Peace. That's what it means to be the gift that Jesus gave to you. So when you are a gift of God, it gives you the ability to act like God. People get irritated when we act like God. But if we don't, then we're acting like somebody else. You see what I'm saying? No, Jesse, I do not see what you're saying. <laughs> you know, uh, he goes from Isaiah 9, 6, famous thing that we read at Christmas time, to Ephesians 5, 1, where it tells us, I'll read it for us here. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children. And then it goes into verse, it's, that's not the entire sentence. It goes into verse two. And walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. So I, I think this is a really good time to, to expand our category for understanding things when we talk about the Bible, right? I know that not all of us like some of the SAT words that I bring to conversations and things like that, but this is why it's sometimes important to know them. So in, in when we talk about preaching, when we talk about applications of the Bible, when we talk about understanding it, if you go to a seminary or, or even a, a not in seminary, if you were to take uh, courses in college or something like that, where they talk about uh, even just how do you understand a text, right? Like, like how do you understand Moby Dick or something like that? They'll talk about these things called exegesis and eisegesis. And I mentioned this stuff before. I may have explained it in another video, but I'm, I'm going to explain it again now. Exegesis is pulling out of something, right? Exe. So you, when you're doing an exegesis of a text is you're taking the exit, like the, the, the meaning out of it. You're looking to the text, text primarily. Eisegesis is inserting meaning into something. So when you say, when I, when I look at like, oh, Moby Dick... Uh, the whale is a sign of capitalism or something like that, right? Well, Herman Melville probably did not intend the whale to be that, right? This is when we come comes to authorial intent. And in 
stuff about literature, there's a lot of debate about whether the intent of the author matters. But when it comes to preaching and talking about like, what does this mean for us now? How do we apply this to our lives? Authorial intent is incredibly important, right? It's not like we go, well, Jesus didn't really intend for these types of things, so I can kind of read it any way I want. No, that's not how we do it, right? Um, so what this means here is Jesse here is, is doing a really good job of showing what eisegesis looks like, right? He looks at this text, which has nothing to do about us, right? The one from Isaiah. It has nothing to do about people. It's pointing to a future Messiah. It's not something that we can claim for ourselves. And then he uses another text from the Bible, Ephesians 5, 1, follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children. And this is where it's like, well, does that actually apply to what he's talking about from Isaiah? Uh, no, right? And even if, like, let's say we wanted to ha show why that's the case, right? You look at it in context. Uh, one of my best uh, professors in undergraduate, a um, guy named Buzz Myers, uh, always said, if you don't understand, keep reading, <laughs> right? So he would say, if you run into something in, in the Bible, uh, you, like, are, like, kind of don't know what to make of it, keep reading, because it ex it'll explain itself later. And I was always, and I've always seen that to be true. Um, whether you're looking at it, at it from a purely secular standpoint or from a religious standpoint, I've actually seen that come up with the text a lot, right? You'll see like someone do something in the Old Testament. You'll be like, why do they do that? And then like several chapters later, it'll be like, oh, and this is why they did that. It's like, oh, okay, well, that makes sense. So, so it's always important to look at the context of these verses. That's why every week when I preach, I usually take a paragraph or two before I get into the text to remind us like where we were. Uh, the kind of the location, e even if I've done it before, right? I preached on Philippians, you know, I don't know, several times, uh, different parts of it. And every time I go, it's a, it's a Philippi is a city in Northern Greece. Uh, and sometimes I explain that it was founded mainly as a place for veterans, right? And that impacts because those details might not seem important sometimes to you when you're thinking about it, right? You're like, well, I just want to know what it says. Well, Paul was writing to these people and they understood in this context, right? It's important to understand the world in which these things were written because while the Bible is a timeless truth and helpful, we can become so much better interpreters of it if we know what's going on at the time. Because if we don't care about what's going on, right? And we just detach it from other parts, we do exactly what Jesse Duplantis did here. So if you wanna understand what Paul is talking about in Ephesians 5, one, you look at what he said before it and what he's saying after it. So what he says before it back in verse, uh, sorry, in chapter four, he's giving them instructions for Christian living. So this is just the first uh, four verses, this 29 to 32 that leads up to the end of it that goes into the fifth chapter. He says, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as, as in Christ God forgave you. And this is where it gets to the thing. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave up himself for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God continuing, but among you, there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. It goes on, right? So you can see there in, in five is he's saying, be like Jesus, <laughs> five, one, and two, right? That's one sentence. Jesse Duplantis kind of hides the, the, the ball, the eight ball there. Uh, and he, he makes it seem like that's a statement in and of itself. But he's saying, be like Jesus, follow God's example and be like Jesus, live a holy life. That's what Paul is, the argument that Paul's making. Has nothing to do with a lot of the other things that Jesse is saying here. Now, why would Jesse do this? Well, when you look at, into him, you find out that he is a uh, prosperity gospel guy, right? And those are the people that say, hey, if you follow the Christian faith, God is going to bless you. He's going to make you... Uh, really, uh, you know, in lots of ways, spiritually, temporally, monetarily powerful, right? Just lean into that. That's what God has promised you. And you see him do that here, right? He takes this promise about the Messiah that we read every Christmas. And he says, this is talking about us because we're supposed to be like God, 
and that somehow means that we are you know he he you see he he does this little trick right because obviously in 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 Isaiah it's not talking it's talking about God is in the Lord and he goes well that means Christ is in us right the Holy Spirit makes us gods right it's really deceptive teaching here um and they're really good at it these prosperity guys um they're one of the things like you can compliment them on is they're really good at being encouraging and they're really good at presentation so they're really good at doing this with a smile so like they can say these really kind of messed up stuff but they're doing it in such a pleasing way that people usually don't think about it and so he he snuck it right in there and said that you know we can be like gods and that's when you get really that's what that's what should kind of ma do a massive red flag uh because that's obviously the promise that the serpent gives in the garden and i'm not saying that jesse duplantis is some you know demon wearing a skin suit or something like that that's not what i'm i'm saying i'm just saying that when we let our concerns outside of the text like our theology Right, so let's say I'm I'm reformed Protestant, right? Let's say I really needed I really wanted to prove Calvin's things about you know, predestination or whatever, and I looked at these that that text in Isaiah nine six, and I went, oh, well, this is clearly talking about predestination, and you can see that because it's a promise in the past going to the future. And this is things that we can say about the elect, you know, people who have been chosen by God. And, and like, it's like, no, that's not what the text is talking about, right? If we wanted to talk about that, we would go to Romans, we would go to, uh, you know, some stuff in Acts, we'd go to other letters in the New Testament, we'd go to Jesus and John. But like, you do what the text is saying, you don't read into it, right? You don't do eisegesis, you want to do exegesis. So I just thought that this was a crazy thing to do, and it's still related to Christmas. And uh, I thought that it's a helpful way of thinking about the Bible and how we ourselves can kind of interpret things. So um, yeah, uh, be careful of things like this. This is why it's really important to know your scripture. And uh, and yes, um, you know, uh, trust your ministers. <laughs> Don't think that they're going to actively mislead you. But if you ever hear anything that kind of sets off, you know, red red warning lights and stuff like that that's when you can come talk to your minister or talk to me or whoever it happens to be and and ask them you know that didn't seem right can you kind of show me what you're talking about um because it's important to do that uh, you don't just kind of accept everything uh wholesale um you test the spirits as we were told right so all right you guys have a wonderful rest of your day i will see you tomorrow for our bible study recap peace out